Okay, so officially uh, welcome to SkinPix's uh, August webinar. As you chose last month, today we will be talking about neuroplasticity, habits, and skin picking. Uh, as always, before we began, I turned on um, uh, the poll for, for the September webinar. So you, if you haven't voted yet, please do so. And if you have any topics that you would like me to include in the polls in, in the coming months, just type them in the Q&A or email them to me afterwards. So this month's topic was, I was very excited because I like neuroplasticity research and it's very interesting to me. But then when I started looking for papers that deal specifically with skin picking, uh, well, let's say that I was not very lucky. So uh, what we will do is we will examine the, the concept of uh, neuroplasticity, and then we will see what is it that we can learn from, from how science currently thinks about it and how we can apply that for, how we can apply that to skin picking. So that's basically how we will go about this webinar. Uh, I will show you some research uh, that deals with mindfulness and neuroplasticity for one specific reason. Well, two reasons really. Uh, one, because a lot of the very exciting research uh, today has to do with mindfulness. Uh, and second, because a lot of the, 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 the effects of, of, of mindfulness are very useful for skin picking. So you will see those are some, the, there are some practical things that you can pick up. And then I will talk to you briefly about expectations for change or rather what is, what is this um, sort of, what is it that science has to tell us about how we change? So that's, uh, that's something that we will be talking about as well. Any questions that you may have uh, about this topic or anything else related to skin picking, as always, use the Q&A uh, button and then I will get to your questions afterwards. So as, you know, as, as I always do, I like to define the terms that I will be talking about. So what is neuroplasticity? The simplest way to look at it is to think of it as our brain's ability to adapt itself based on experience. If you've been to any of my previous webinars, uh, you may know my, that I have un, you know, an undying love for George Kelly's constructivist psychology. And this is pretty much the way that he thinks about humans as well. He says that basically our psyche is made up of these structures that he calls constructs. These constructs, essentially determine your worldview, tell you what you can see and what meaning you can describe to that. And then as you interact with the world, the experience that you generate changes your constructs as well. So it's, all, it's kind of like, um, like a continuous loop that happens where you interact with the world, the world changes you, and then in return, you see the world differently, and then that world changes you and so on. So the same thing goes with neuroplasticity. Our brain is changed based on the experiences that it gets. And then the way that the brain changes, changes the way we interact with the world. So neuroplasticity is just this ability of our brain to kind of adjust itself to its current circumstances. This is the most down to earth definition of it that I could find. And the, the reason why I selected specifically this definition is because as I was digging while I was on, you know, on PubMed looking for papers, everything was fine and dandy. But then as I started going through more popular um, you know, writings on neuroplasticity, I kept finding these very outlandish ideas and claims on, on, on what neuroplasticity is. And basically, you know, if you go down the Reddit rabbit holes long enough, you will learn that apparently you can develop you know, paranormal abilities with neuroplasticity, which you can't. So you're not going to grow a, a part of your brain with neuroplasticity. It's just our brain's ability to, re, to respond by altering its function and structure based on what is happening around it, based on the environment that it's in and its interactions with the environment. So this is a relatively new idea in a certain sense. So my first sentence here is that the idea that brain is plastic and able to change is as old as the idea that it can't. Uh, 
And the reason why I'm saying this is because this concept of neuroplasticity under different names has been present in neuroscience essentially since it first started and in reality even before. So in like 18th century, there were scientists who would make rats and other animals do these repetitive activities all the time. And then they would dissect their brains and see that certain parts of their brains would become different than those of let's say a typical mouse or a rat or whatever they would use for these experiments. So that's also neuroplasticity, right? It tells you that brains of certain animals adapt in response to specific activities that they have to perform. Um, the, the term plasticity or brain as being plastic was explicitly first introduced by William James in his Principles of Psychology, although it was really ignored for a very long time. And I find this to be highly amusing, I have to say, uh, because William James is obviously one of the great names of psychology of all times and philosophy as well. And I, I really like to think about how James and Freud, for example, who is another great name, post, greater than James really in many ways, uh, how they're both really giants in our field, but their reception today is vastly different. So whereas Freud is essentially, it's like a badge of honor for every neuroscientist or a psychologist or even a therapist to basically dismiss Freud, especially those that don't ever read or understand Freud, they like to dismiss him. William James is still referenced as a kind of great figure, as a great intellectual. But what amuses me about this is that with Freud, people will pick and choose all these ideas that don't work anymore, and then they will use this as evidence against him. Whereas when it comes to William James, they kind of conveniently ignore whatever doesn't fit the dogma of the day. So even though he did talk about brain as being not just able to adapt, he said it was extraordinarily plastic. So for James, our brains were very, very malleable. So how about far from, from these static, highly differentiated structures that, that, that we learned, that I even learned about in medical school, and I didn't exactly go to medical school 100 years ago. James wrote a lot of stuff on very different topics. So for example, currently, so whereas now we can say that James talked about neuroplasticity like 100 years ago, he, for example, has a book about studying psychic abilities and he was obsessed with visiting mediums. So this is one aspect of William James that no one holds against him, whereas Freud like cocaine and everyone will point that out in five minutes. So this is just me complaining of historical injustices. But anyway, the, the idea that brain is plastic was introduced in psychology by William James, although it was completely ignored. So principles of psychology came out somewhere like early 20th century. And until the point where I was in medical school, pretty much you know, every serious researcher would either say that that's not possible or be extremely cautious about this. There was research in the meantime, like in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, some big names in neuroscience have done research related to neuroplasticity. But the way that they would go about this would be in a very kind of down to earth way, like people who were recovering from strokes, for example, or they would make monkeys do certain tasks and then dissect their brains. Uh, there, I would say two reasons for this. And this is my opinion, so you don't really have to take it as, as gospel. One is that uh, we indeed really until very recently thought about neural tissue as being extremely highly differentiated and very sophisticated. So it was thought that it's really quite not possible to change it. It was thought of as being very inert, like this you know, wonderful piece of like this marble sculpture, which is really beautiful, but it's always going to be a marble structure. In fact, we used to think that you can only lose neurons, but never gain new ones as you grow older. Uh, so that would be one thing, like in science ought to be this most sublime form of skepticism, but it has its dogmas and this was one of them. So that was one of the reasons why these studies were kind of very rare and results weren't taken perhaps as serious as they should, should have been. And the second reason is that we really until fairly recently didn't have the technology to actually do research because you can make a monkey do something, then kill the monkey and then measure you know, the thickness of, 
of certain structures of, of the monkey's brains. But you can't really do that with humans, at least for the greater part of the 20th century, you couldn't. So this is why only recently we were able to have experimental data that shows how plasticity actually works. In terms of how, a how it works on a molecular level, that is a mystery. There, there are a lot of interesting studies and it goes a little bit outside of the scope of, of what we're talking about here, perhaps some other time. But that's something that I think is like the next frontier. It's, it's rather mysterious, at least my understanding of it is that that's how it is. And then of course, mindfulness research is quite important there because um, some of the most interesting studies on neuroplasticity were done using people who meditate because it's a skill that's easy to teach and you know it's measurable. And you can see what happens when people drop the skill, what happens when they continue to use it, and you can follow it more easily. And also it does help that mindfulness is such a big word these days. So whatever you do that has to do with mindfulness by default gets attention. So I'm going to tell you about an example of neuroplasticity that is actually a part of everyone's sort of development. It's a natural process that happens. And even when back when I was in medical school, we knew about this and learned about this in psychiatry um, and phys histology, I believe, and embryology. Like we had a lot of courses where synaptic pruning was talked about, but this is now looking back a form of neuroplasticity. So what is it that I'm talking about and why is this important for anyone? So synaptic pruning is essentially a process that takes place since you're very little. So there's like one part of your development where the number of neurons and connections between them explodes. So there's a lot of them. And then it happens is, is a kind of rapid decline, let's say, that the number of connections between neurons falls. And this process of these connections disappearing lasts somewhere between the ages of 12 and 16. Although some studies show that it can go back into the late twenties, although mostly in the area that we call the prefrontal cortex, which is just a fancy way of saying the, the, the cortex of the brain that's right above your eyes, more or less. But you know, there's, a, there's a simpler way to, to present it. Uh, this is important because prefrontal cortex is what gives us more, it, what gives us more control over our behavior. It allows us to think, it controls our executive functioning. So it's quite important that this part is actually can, can be reshaped for, for longer periods of time. So what is pruning? It's kind of like a self-cleaning process where from time to time, uh, our brains eliminate all those connections between neurons. So synapses are connections between neurons that don't serve any purpose to it. So how does, how does your brain know whether or not a connection will serve a significant purpose or not? It's very simple. It's those connections that are used very frequently. Um, a friend of mine who is an architect told me once that uh, sometimes when people build parks in buildings, in buildings, sorry, I don't, okay. I may be having a stroke now. So when they build parks, what they do is that they don't design where the paths, paths will lead. Instead, they just put the grass and then allow people to walk around. And then organically sort of paths will be created where, where people think it's most convenient to walk. And then basically you can pour concrete there and make a normal, normal path. This is the same thing that happens to our brains. So our brains basically look at those connections that are used very often. And if they're used very often, they're deemed to be useful and active, and then they're preserved. And if they're not, then they go away. They're dissolved. So this is remodeling of the brain based on experience. So it falls within the definition of, of what, we, what we call, what I just defined as neuroplasticity, basically. Um, however, when, when, when I was in medical school, this was interpreted in a very pessimistic way, meaning, well, as you grow older, you know, you have fewer and fewer connections and fewer and fewer neurons and basically you just get dumber and slower. So this is not the case. It may be the case if we let ourselves go, as you will see, but it does not have to be the case. In fact, this idea that our brain will reshape itself is fundamentally important for our mental health. 
there are some ideas that certain psychiatric issues, like, for example, schizophrenia and even autism, have to do with uh, synaptic pruning or rather lack, lack of it. That sometimes some, un, let's say, some connections that aren't necessarily useful remain instead of being taken away. And then this later on in life might cause the sim some of the symptoms of schizophrenia and autism. To my knowledge, as far as autism spectrum is concerned, there's, there, there are not too many studies with this, but there are some findings for schizophrenia that indicate that it might be a promising avenue of research. This is how every scientific paper ends, like with a lot of you know, caveats, like it might be useful to research more. But either way, that is one, one way in which our brain reshapes itself. And it's a way that happens with everyone. So every person on this call has had this process or is having this process if you're of the right age. Except that what we're talking about here is losing connections. Neuroplasticity also includes the other side, which is creating new connections and altering the existing ones, which is exactly what we need to zero in if we're going to talk about how, to, how neuroplasticity can help us with skin picking. Roughly speaking, we have two types of neuroplasticity. You have the functional kind and the structural kind. So functional neuroplasticity is essentially when our brain reorganizes itself within existing structures as a response to some sort of change. So um, let's say if you're using, if you're learning a new language. So your brain needs to reorganize itself because you're introducing a whole new way of thinking, a whole new vocabulary. It, it, it asks a lot of brain capacity. Like it, it asks, you ask of your brain basically to accommodate for many new things. So it might need to strengthen certain connections. Another more radical example would be um, let's say um, if you have a stroke. So essentially, if you have a stroke, you lose a part of your brain tissue. So there's a part of the brain structure that doesn't exist anymore and that will never come back. So what the brain does is it uses the healthy tissues to rewire those, those things that were lost you know, in the structure that was affected by the stroke. This is why when people lose, let's say some of their motor skills, or speech, either understanding or speaking, some of this can be recovered because of functional neuroplasticity. Because our brains will spontaneously over time learn how to perform the same function using different pathways. They will, new pathways will essentially be created. Structural neuroplasticity is when you actually have physical change in your brain in response to certain experiences. So, this is something that, for example, we have, we know from mindfulness research. That would be it. I will tell you more about this in details, but just remember for now that there are two main ideas. One is that the that brain can give different functions to, to existing structures, or that you can actually add more neurons to the brain. So structured neuroplasticity doesn't mean that there will be like a new, new part of your brain. It means that the thickness of certain parts might change either to become thicker, which is what we usually want to do, or to become thinner, as it happens spontaneously, for example, when people age. And in certain psychiatric issues, there are some studies, for example, that show that um, in, in chronic schizophrenia, for example, you lose some of the, the, your brain kind of remodels itself in a way that some structures become smaller than they used to be. So what does it depend on? how plastic your brain will be and in what direction you can take it. Genetics obviously plays a role. So I can't tell you like if it's one gene or 57 or 725 uh, or whatever number, but because this is a capacity that we all have, it obviously has some sort of genetic basis. Like there are certain genetic mechanisms that we were born with. It is also possible that they simply might work better with some people than others, but how exactly, like we can't exactly predict this. There's not a model that I'm aware of or able to find. Younger brains also tend to be more plastic than older brains. Uh, this is also something that we know from studies, but it's 
kind of common sense if you think about it, like our culture tells us that. And then this third thing is, is what I think is very important for us here, which is that lifestyle can either potentiate or inhibit neuroplasticity. That means that depending on how you live your life, what kinds of habits you have, how healthy your lifestyle is, you can either slow down or accelerate your, your brain's ability to change. So for example, learning a new skill or continuously learning new skills is something that will keep your brain, brain plastic because it will keep it active. And when you add new skills, you're continuously making your brain create new pathways as well. So for example, um, learning a new language, let's say, that would be one example, or learning how to paint, uh, or I don't know, like learning how to read, write with your non-dominant hand, or learning how to assemble furniture, whatever might be a new skill for you. It doesn't matter if that skill is directly in any way related to skin picking, the very fact that you stimulate your brain through learning new activities will make it overall more plastic. So essentially learning something new. Uh, this can also mean like learning about a specific subject, or at least I'm hoping that research will show that that's the case because I'm that that would be my chosen way because I'm a very curious person and I will read a book about nearly anything. The stranger it is, the more I will read about it. So for example, that would be one way to stimulate your brain. Um, you can use like even those games like Sudoku and stuff like this, the, all, all of these can help with brain plasticity. Then the second one is something that I would normally maybe leave out of the list, but because of my previous week, where at least six clients have told me that they don't have time to rest or sleep because that means they're not productive, I've decided that I'm going to include this and I almost put it in red letters and in all caps. But sleeping and resting actually actually helps your brain become more plastic. Specifically, I found a study that shows that plasticity of dendrites, if you remember, there are two types of sort of structures that come out of neurons. Those, those uh, like the longer ones that are called axons and then the shorter ones that are called dendrites. And so dendrites tend to reorganize themselves or we tend to grow new ones when we're sleeping or resting because sleep helps our brain kind of consolidate everything that happened during the day. So you have to sleep. Sleeping and resting is not a waste of time. It's actually quite productive. It's only just productive for your brain, maybe not for your work. And then physical activity. This is something that can work in two ways. Uh, one, obviously physical activity will cause neuroplasticity of specific, um, of specific parts of your body of your brain, sorry, that, that have to do with the physical activity that you're engaged in. And then overall kind of like learning new skills will keep your brain overall more plastic. So basically there is no reason for people not to, let's say harness the power of neuroplasticity. It's just that you might have to work a little more at it and approach it from different directions, especially, this especially goes for, for people who are older, on average, and people, if we're talking about skin picking, people have been picking for a very, very long time. Because I guess one thing that you could have maybe concluded from, from what I was talking about is that the longer a habit or a behavior pa behavioral pattern persists, the stronger those connections will be. So it will take more of an effort to rewire them. So an important rule, uh, it's called Hebb's rule, Neurons that fire together, wire together. It's very easy to remember, and it's an extraordinarily important principle uh, in neuroscience in general. That means that sequences of events that repeat themselves, like neurons that, that are activated at the same time, tend to be connected after a while. So, for example, if we look at skin picking, how it works. So first, there is a difficult emotional experience or something that you cannot possibly deal with or you think that you can deal with. So you obviously realize this, you know, oh my God, I can't handle this. And then you pick because picking is a way to escape what you think you cannot handle. And then picking has this soothing effect 
it causes gratification. You will extract something from your skin and you will feel validated and it will be good. And that kind of validation actually reinforces the behavior. So it assures that you will pick again. Sometimes when people talk about um, habits and different, let's say, parts of habits, they will not create these five steps that I created here. They will say there are only three steps. There's the trigger, there's the behavior, and there's the validation. And then this repeats itself all the time. It's very difficult and even counterintuitive for people to think about skin picking in terms of it being good for something. But even if you're an if you're a person that has an extremely reductionist approach to skin picking and you want to say that it's nothing but a bad habit, even in that case, you have to ask yourself one question, and that is, well, why this habit and not something else? Because the reason why something became a habit is because it does something for us, right? So it serves a purpose. And this purpose is the, the validation step that I was mentioning or step four and step five in this case. So it's the gratification or the self-soothing, the fact that it successfully, um, it allows you to successfully avoid certain emotions without being able to process them. And then in psychotherapy, when we dig and analyze your feelings and thoughts and your needs, we do that so that we understand exactly what is it that picking validates. Because when I say gratification or soothing, it's a very general term. I mean, I guess self-soothing would be intuitively clear to people, but gratification is not always the way that people describe it. Sometimes they will say release. Sometimes they will say relief. Sometimes they will say that it has a calming effect. So it's all in the spectrum of some sort of urgency of need disappearing. And what we do in therapy very often when we go beyond this behaviorist approach is that we explore precisely what that means. What are the needs that are behind it? What is it that's being validated? You will see when I talk about sort of how to, let's say, break or substitute a habit, you will see that this is really the key point. Because if you try to replace picking without providing the same or similar gratification that, that it gives you, you will not receive the same validation. And this is very important to do, not just on the level of um, like on the, let's say on the sensory level or on the aesthetic level, but also on the level of what that means to you on a more psychological level. So it is necessary to sort of dive in beneath the surface a little bit, because that's what makes us do it over and over and over again. Because if you think about it, um, it's our natural sort of tendency to move away from something that's bad and move closer to something that's good. Like amoebas do the same thing. Like if there's something that's a nutrient, they will go close to it. So even single-celled organisms do that. This is a logical evolutionary strategy, but for humans, it does tend to backfire sometimes. Like when avoiding your emotions, for example, uh, in some cases or in most cases leads to skin picking. But then you might wonder, how is skin picking good? If we tend to avoid what's unpleasant and bad, People tend to do a lot of damage to their skin, sometimes cause scarring, infections, uh, not to mention shame, embarrassment, wanting to hide from people. And in spite of all this, it still persists. And that tells you how profound that validation is. That when you put all the negatives and then the validation, the validation kind of wins. So this, what I marked as step four here, or what in, in, when we talk about habits, what we would call as validation is extremely important because this is where you start unpacking, picking in order to find different and healthier habits to substitute with. In psychotherapy, we tend to go about it in several, on several different levels parallel to each other. So, this is a slight simplification, but this really is a crucial thing. Because very often when we, in skin pick at least in our program, the way that we work is that we first get you started with a behavioral treatment called habit reversal. And then we move on to slightly more complex and profound ideas. 
The reason for this is because with habit reversal, you establish a degree of control, you're able to minimize damage, it, it is empowering. But one thing that people will say is that whatever replacement habit they choose, it doesn't feel as good. And this is a very common thing. And then I will explain that the point is not for it to feel as good because the point is to get control, minimize damage, and that's it. But, they, but what they're saying is that the validation is not the same. And then this is what we explore so that the, we could create change that's sustainable in the long run as well. Because the, whatever the source of validation is, it is a valid need to have. If you think about it, even if you just stay on the level of self-soothing, well, that's not exactly a pathological need, is it? It's just that the way in which you go about doing it causes harm for you. But there is really no, no problem with the idea of self-soothing. People will, I don't know, wrap themselves in a blanket sometimes or sleep with a teddy bear or eat junk food or eat ice cream, which I cannot put in the category of junk food because I like it too much. So, you know, people do all kinds of things that will soothe them. People will use drugs to self-soothe as well. So self-soothing is a normal, natural need that every human has. It's just that the way we go about getting that need, satisfying that need with picking maybe isn't the smartest or, or the healthiest way. So if you're in therapy currently with us or anywhere else, and you feel resistance to talking about why picking is useful, um, I'm so sorry if it's very noisy. Usually this side of the street is very quiet. So this is, the, this is sort of the, the key point, is to understand what is it that you're validating by picking. So how do we approach change when, you think about, when we think about it in terms of brain function and brain structure? So in this webinar, you know, last month, we had a webinar that was dominantly psychological. And we talked about meaning and these kinds of you know, psychological, emotional topics. This one is obviously more technical and more science in that respect, even though I do really try to make it as practical as possible. Uh, but this depends on the topics that you choose. So far, I've noticed a trend, which I'm sure is not, is not on purpose, considering how many of you vote and, and visit our webinars, is that one webinar tends to be like this, and then another one tends to be more clinical, and then they kind of go back and forth. So how to approach change in three simple and not very easy steps. First, we have to stop reinforcing the existing pattern. That means that we have to stop reinforcing picking. This is why skin pick starts with habit reversal training, because it introduces a set of different habits that you can then use. And by using something else, you're no longer reinforcing the existing pattern. Sometimes, however, you need to think wider. It's not just about whether or not you reinforce the act of picking itself, but sometimes it could be behaviors around skin picking because for many people, picking is not like an isolated event that takes place and then disappears. It is a part of a ritual sometimes. So people will specifically go to the bathroom, let's say, to look at their skin and then find something to pick. That is also a pattern that you should stop reinforcing. Uh, sometimes skin picking will involve a whole procedure, um, getting the lights right, using a specific mirror, use, bringing your tools or whatever you might use. Again, this is also a pattern that needs to be, that you need to stop reinforcing. Sometimes that means giving up precious tools that you use for other stuff, like tweezers, for example. So to stop reinforcing existing patterns doesn't mean to just force yourself using willpower to stop picking. I will talk about willpower in just a few minutes. I'm completely against it, spoiler alert. But it's, you have to have a good overview of what all the patterns that somehow contribute to picking. Sometimes this means if you have a 90 hour work week, that pattern has to stop. Or if you have a pattern of not saying no to people, maybe that pattern has to stop. Because as if, if there's one thing that you could have noticed from, from what I was talking about previously is that things tend to be connected to each other and then they reinforce each other in the brain. So there are other, other patterns that contribute to skin picking indirectly. 
and feed into it and maintain it. So what you need to do is have an honest and clear overview of these existing patterns. I guess one way from a more psychological point of view that we can talk about it is to talk about acceptance, sort of seeing where skin picking is in the scope of, of your life or things you have to do. So that would be one thing. The second thing is that you can't just stop doing something. It's kind of like when people go on a diet and then they decide that they will just stop eating or that, you know, like when they tried, like I have a client who's been trying to become vegetarian for like forever. And that happens by when, when he says, well, you know, starting from Monday, I will never eat meat again. And then three months later, he makes the same decision because meat, eating meat is obviously in some way psychologically relevant. And then you can't just give up something that is psychologically relevant to you because there is a legitimate need behind it. A need needs to be satisfied. Like you can't stop eating if you're on a diet, you just have to eat in a specific way. So if let's, for, for the sake of simplicity, let's say that self-soothing is what picking does. I know that it will seem reductive to you, but I guess to understand the principle, we kind of have to be a little reductive. So you can't just stop picking because the need to soothe yourself is not going to go away. So you will need to find another way to self-soothe. And then in addition to this, you may have to take a step back either during therapy or on your own and see which patterns feed into this need to self-soothe. It's exactly like appetite. Sometimes you'll have more of it. Sometimes you'll have less of it. If you continuously have the need to self-soothe, that means that there is something that is obviously upsetting you, something that is creating a lot of emotional tension. So then you need to unwrap those little packages and see what's in there. So a typical story that I hear is someone who works too much, then has no time for friends, no time for family, no time for dating, no time for uh, just resting, no time for I don't know, hobbies, no time to sleep. And then they say, well, now I will stop picking. So you eliminate every source of relaxation and soothing and everything else from your life. And then you give up even skin picking, which does it in a damaging way, but does it nonetheless. You're actually not doing a service to yourself. It's kind of aggressive towards yourself if you think about it, because you are denying yourself something that's quite vital. So, so along with stopping and reinforcing picking, you have to replace it with another pattern. So you have to adopt a different way of behaving. So competing responses that I mentioned would be one way to do that partially, but then other ways as well. For example, introducing healthier ways to soothe yourself. Or if you need self-soothing because it's very difficult for you to, to be present and open to what you're feeling, then maybe learning how to deal with your emotions in a healthy way would be the way to go. If you need self-soothing because you're stressed out, then either stress management or giving up some things in life, which can be quite difficult for people. And I've seen people say, I would rather pick than you know, work fewer hours, for example. It's a decision, I don't think it's a healthy decision, but it is a decision that adults get to make. But the point is, is that sometimes you, so you have to A, replace the pattern. Two, it might not be that obvious what is it that needs replacing. So you need to really get to know picking and what purpose it serves. So what validation you get. And then third, sometimes you might not even replace it with one pattern. You might need two different habits. Because we are looking for something that is A, sustainable in the long term, and also B, uh, relatively easy and simple to implement. So that sometimes means using different strategies. Whereas perhaps you can pick in your office and pick in your bathroom. Uh, if you choose to replace picking with, um, I don't know, um, meditation, you might meditate at home, but you cannot meditate at work. And then also one thing to consider is the meditation has its effects in the law, you know, it takes a while for meditation to, to actually show its effects. So you again need something else in those acute situations. 
So depending on your life context, you might actually have to re, re change one pattern with two or three. When this is happening, and when you have to replace one with several, my warmest advice is to do it one by one. A common error that I see is when people start the program and then start habit reversal as the, you know, the, the beginning, like the first part of the program. And then they get to session three, which is where you actually start implementing certain techniques. They often write something like, okay, so I will start with these six. And then I think you're going to try and establish six new habits at the same time. I mean, if you can do that, maybe you can grow wings with willpower because it seems completely inhuman. Like it seems just too much. So one is a good number to start with. Two, if you have no problems with discipline. But introducing and reinforcing new patterns is really not that easy to do. And when you try to do too much at once, you're all but guaranteeing failure. And I'm not talking about, you know, those little failures that we have along the way that we can learn from. I mean that you will overwhelm yourself and confuse yourself. Because one thing that makes picking such an excellent way of self-soothing is that it's very simple. Like you know immediately what you need to do. Sometimes you don't even need to make a conscious decision to do it. You just, your hand just goes up to your face, for example, or starts touching your shoulders or whatever you pick. So simplicity is, is one of the things that maintains it because you don't need, for the most part, you don't need any special conditions or special tools. I've heard people, you know, picking their shoulders or their arms, even in front of other people that don't even know what's happening. So whatever your new pattern is, has to have this kind of versatility. If you try then to replace one behavior with six different ones, Imagine how that works when the urge comes about. So you feel this strong urge to pick. And so now instead of picking, you have to say, okay, let me see which one of these six would be most appropriate now. That immediately is a bad strategy because by the time you figure it out, you will already be picking. So it has to be done one by one. Just remember that. And then once you select new behavioral patterns that you want to reinforce, I mean, once you select them, you have to reinforce them. And reinforcing them is also not very simple. As you can notice, I started with an idea that it's simple and now I'm building more and more and it's getting more and more complicated. So this is not an official division. This is just a way to break up reinforcement into components so that you understand everything that it entails. But you, there, it, it's not like a specific order in which you have to go about doing it. One is that you have to have an intention. So that means that you have to be very specific about what you will be doing and you have to keep it in mind. If you keep forgetting, put it in a sticky note and put it on your screen or somewhere like that. But you have to be very clear about what your goal is. I mean, the overarching goal is obviously to stop picking, but you need to have weekly goals. Like I will reduce picking by 10% at work, for example. And then you select specific moments that are very high risk moments and you make sure that you keep your intention in mind. Second, and I will show you also when I present you some of the research, some of the research in neuroplasticity and mindfulness, I will show you that there's really some evidence for this. It's not like I pulled it out of my, you know what. Second is mindfulness. So I don't mean here necessarily mindfulness is a formal practice. In fact, in acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, mindfulness is often talked about as mindfulness without meditation. So it just means being aware, especially in those risky situations. If picking is a response that your brain has kind of hardwired um, as, as, as what you do when you feel stressed, for example, then you have to be very mindful of how stressed you are you exactly and how stressful a situation that you're in currently is because that tells you that you might need to use whatever new pattern you're trying to implement. Without having that kind of awareness, intention means nothing. So they have to be coupled. Then there's incorporation. Obviously you have to do it. Then there's validation. And so here by validation, I mean two things. One, it should actually provide at least a portion of the validation that picking itself provides. 
but then you have to additionally validate yourself. That means when you do do it well, when you apply the new pattern in a, in a good way, you actually have to actively validate yourself. Either, I don't know, like if you have a day without picking, reward yourself with something, I don't know, smile. That's something that actually works quite well. Every time you use the new pattern well, smile. Just pause for a second and smile because your brain will recognize what that means. The reason for this is because what we usually do is the exact opposite. Meaning when we do something well, we say, okay, this time I did it well. And then you just go on you know, with your day. Uh, however, if you do something wrong, you're very likely to spend you know, like half an hour just chastising yourself and being very, very angry at yourself. Uh, your brain will understand this properly. Like if you get, if you start judging yourself, you know, you don't really need an IQ of 600 to realize that you shouldn't be doing this. But this is not exactly clear and useful information to your brain. Imagine if you ask me what's the topic for next month's webinar, and I tell you we will not be talking about shoes. I mean, I can guarantee you, I don't know what you've selected, but I can guarantee you that we will not be talking about shoes because none of the topics is about that. But you still have no idea what you will be hearing about. So you don't know whether or not you will want to tune in or watch the webinar later on. And the same way is like this. When you pick and you get angry at yourself, what your brain understands is, okay, not this. But not this is not precise information. Like imagine if, if you come to crossroad and then your GPS tells you don't go left and you still have like, to go straight ahead or turn right or I don't know what else. So when you validate yourself for a new pattern that you're implementing, you're telling your brain this, this is good. You're giving it very specific instruction, which helps reinforce the pattern. Because remember, neurons that fire together, wire together. So you connect the reward to what you just did. So you're making your brain kind of remember those circuits because your brain wants more reward and not less. Then another part of this reinforcement is analysis. This is something that you cannot escape in therapy, but if, if you try to do it on your own, you might want to kind of you spontaneously just run away from that. That means from time to time sitting down, I like to get people to either journal or just write things down somewhere or you know, send messages to me or whatever so that we can evaluate where this pattern works well and where it doesn't work well. Remember, from if you remember in the beginning when we talked about what neuroplasticity is, it's how our brain shapes itself based on our experience. Uh, when it comes to any tool that we have, so behavioral patterns are tools. Let me go back to Kelly for a second because I didn't put his picture in, in, you know, in these slides and I feel guilt that I'm not promoting you know, my favorite theorist enough. But what, what Kelly basically talks about is that whatever construct you have, its use is always limited. So overall, whatever worldview that you develop, whatever tools that you have, they're always only useful in a specific context. So for you to use them efficiently and to use them consistently, you have to know what this context is. Otherwise, you risk thinking you have a bad tool. So sometimes, let me give you an example of something that I think I talk to nearly every client at some point, which is wearing gloves. Wearing gloves is incredibly efficient. Uh, people are hesitant to try it for different reasons, all of which can be subsumed under resistance. But either way, they're reluctant to try them. But then when they do, they realize that gloves actually work. But then, let's say like a week later, they will tell me, well, gloves actually really don't work. And the reason why is because they start then thinking, okay, so if this used, if this worked while I was watching TV, then let me use it at work. But then as soon as you go to work, you realize that your colleagues will ask you, you know, you're an accountant, why exactly are you wearing latex gloves all day? And then most people, you know, because of the shame and the stigma or just because they're coworkers, don't really feel like explaining why. And then they just declare the strategy unacceptable. Whereas in reality, the case is that it is extremely useful only in a specific context. 
And this kind of analysis helps you to determine where is it that you can use this pattern the best. And then your brain is likely to create a very precise circuit to remember it. So the more specific information you give your brain, and when you do it over time, it's more likely that it will be remembered as a useful tool. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you will come up with, with the same conclusion for every strategy, which is it worked for a while and then it stopped working. Or ah, kinda, but doesn't work quite well. And it's not that it doesn't work well, it's just that you didn't situate it in a proper context. So you need to analyze both your successes and your failures. And then you need discipline. And so this is where I differ from a lot of people, which is that I really don't believe in willpower. I think willpower is a very weak resource. Um, it can be strong, but then, it, uh, it, then it's, it lasts for a very short period of time. That's not the way in which we create sustainable change. So willpower is like if your car stops 10 meters away from your house and then you push it, that's willpower. But you're not going to be pushing your car to work, right? It doesn't work. Discipline, on the other hand, does. And most of you that are listening to me now are disciplined enough. But again, it's all a matter of context. Somehow people don't see themselves as being disciplined, but then they tell me that they work 11 hours a day, six days a week, and do everything on time at work. That, if that's not discipline, I don't know what is, because most of the, these exact people will report waking up in the morning and wishing to immediately go back to sleep because they're exhausted. But because of the discipline that they have, they will get up and go to work. And that's exactly what you need to reinforce new patterns. So you don't need brute force, you need discipline. Discipline is calculated and it's clear. The, the difference between discipline and, and willpower is not just in the fact that discipline will get you far, willpower won't. Discipline is also clearly connected to your values and to your sense of who you are. In the sense that you're doing this because you want to be a better parent, like a role model for your child. So when you recall this and kind of reinforce your commitment to being a better parent, that gives you then more discipline as well, because you, you will have more um, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word motivation because just like willpower, motivation tends to oscillate, but discipline is more about following the structures that you set for yourself. This is tremendously important. So the, the key thing that I would really like all of you to remember is that neuroplasticity is slow. So slow, 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 slow. That means that your brain needs time to reorganize. When people start treatment or really anything else, they kind of expect quick results. And sometimes they will get quick results, but then a more difficult period will come and then they will immediately give up because they will think they have failed. That's not how neuroplasticity works. You will see in one of the studies exactly what I mean. But the, the way to think about it is that in the beginning, you need to try extra hard and you will probably achieve good results. But then you will have a plateau, meaning that there will be a period when you will not be advancing further, you will stop at a certain level, and then there will be a drop. And then if at that point, you don't analyze, validate, recalibrate, you will decline. But when this drop happens, if you learn from it, then you go back up. Because if you stop, all the reinforcement that you've sort of done in the past will eventually go away because our brains are plastic. So if you start picking again for five months, your previous three months of, of reinforcement of another uh, habit will eventually go away. In the long, we currently don't know what is the threshold that you have to pass for these changes to be permanent, if they're ever permanent, or let's say at least long lasting. It's hard to say. And I've, I've, I've seen studies, um, most of them deal with mindfulness in terms of even when you achieve even structural neuroplasticity. So 
cortical thickness that increases. The question that we don't have answered because we don't really have enough studies yet is how long will this last if you stop reinforcing the behavioral pattern? Because every time you pick, you reinforce it, right? So if you, let's say, do mindfulness every day and then you achieve a level of emotional stability, if you stop doing it, what part of that will disappear and what part of that will stay? We don't have an answer to this question. So the reasonable thing would be just don't stop. That, that would be the most reasonable answer. So other than time, repetition is needed. So if there are some of you from the program here, your therapist probably told you at some point that when you start implementing competing responses or really anything else, that you need to do it all the time, that you need to create a habit out of it. That means that if you're going to substitute picking with another type of behavior, you really should be practicing that behavior even if you don't feel the need to pick as long as you're in the context where you pick sometimes. Because we have to remember what I said about every pattern having its sort of specific context where it works. So you need to establish it as a habit in a specific context independently of picking and then slowly you replace them. But so time and repetition, both absolutely necessary. And then obviously discipline. And then as Samuel Beckett once said, fail again and fail better. Because when we introduce new habits, they're not as they're not hardwired into our brain the way that old habits are. So we are more likely to fail. And we cannot take that failure as being as being a proof that we are failures. We just see that as new information. So okay, this strategy didn't work in this particular context. Let's see why. And then let's learn from it and then try again and then fail again in the sense that even that strategy will have some limitation, right? The same way that if you think about it, even picking, it is self-soothing, but it's not always self-soothing. So even picking has its range of sort of where it works best. So let me now show you two studies, one that talks more about functional and then the other one that talks about structural neuroplasticity. They're both related to, to mindfulness. And before I do that, let me lift my video feed up so that I can actually see the title. So uh, this study is called, it basically studies the impact of, of meditation on amygdala and how that part of our limbic system reacts to emotional stimuli. So uh, amygdala has to do with emotional processing, specifically with responses like anger or aggression or you know things like that, the, the more negative side of emotions. Amygdala is basically like this little, little ball of gray matter that's buried deep in, the, in our brains. It's also evolutionary, kind of an older structure. So in this study, they basically had two groups of people. One, a group of experienced meditators who had about 9,000 hours of meditation behind them. So that's quite a lot. Um, they had specific conditions, like they had to go on retreats, they had to have been meditating for at least three years and so on. And then short-term meditators, people who complete MBSR in eight weeks. MBSR is mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's a program developed by a wonderful man called John Kabat-Zinn. And if someone's raising their hands, just please ask a question in the Q&A if you, if you have one. So what they did in this study is that they took the people who never meditated before, uh, they measured their responses to different stimuli. They were showing them pictures who were either uh, neutral, positive, or negative. And then they, they, had, they scanned their brains to see how they react in real time. And then they would also fill out questionnaires like self-reports to see how what they report as experiencing correlates to what they can see in their brains. Because obviously, whatever you see in the brain, unless I actually feel a difference, you know, who cares? So they would treat them, in the, they would test them in the beginning, then teach them meditation through MBSR and then test them again. And then they also tested people who are long-term meditators. And then they compared the similarities and differences and observed how amygdala reactions changed depending on how many hours of meditation you have uh, behind you. 
So overall, the conclusion is, is that people who have had meditation practices for a very long time had the most reduction in amygdala activity, which is good. You don't want your amygdala to go too crazy. So that would give you emotional stability. Meaning that the more you meditate, the better you get emo at emotional control. But here's the catch. So I made a little screenshot from the, from the paper. So they say over time, the practice of observing thoughts non-reactively, which is really just meditation, but scientists have to invent these long words that sound like you know, much smarter, may lead to greater automatic emotional regulation, similar to extinction processes that recruit v VMPFC. So this is, again, a complicated way to say ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is an even more complicated way to say basically the part of your brain cortex just underneath here, like in the center between your eyebrows, like that part of the cortex, and then under your eyes. Okay, so listen, so what they found here is that people who meditate for a long time overall don't react to emotional stimuli as intensely as people who have had less experience or no experience with meditation. But they found something that puzzled them, which is that people, that, that one thing doesn't decrease, which is how you react to negative stimuli, so to the bad images that you were shown. Turns out that no matter how long you meditate, you react the same way. However, the self-reports were very different, which led them to believe that people who meditate for a long time, it's not that they don't experience negative emotions, it's just that they actually approach them differently. So they have a different way of handling them, a way which doesn't cause additional suffering or distress. So here's what they say. Uh, the process strengthened by mindfulness meditation is not a specific decrease in reactivity to negative stimuli, so you don't become callous and insensitive, but rather may impact emotional responding more generally and is consistent with the view from contemplative traditions that this practice decreases stickiness, the power of emotions to linger and alter subsequent experience, by reducing the propensity to avoid unpleasant and grasp at pleasant experiences. This is not the height of beautiful prose, but basically what it means is that you let your emotions come and go and don't really get attached to them. Because if Buddhists, for example, will tell you that suffering doesn't come because some experiences are unpleasant. Suffering comes because when you have unpleasant experiences, you want to push them away, but you can't. So you suffer in the process. Or when you feel something that's remarkably good and rewarding, you kind of want to hug it and not let it go away. And because all our experiences eventually go away, this process of clinging to the pleasant also creates suffering. So this is essentially what they're saying is that long-term meditation practice teaches you how to relate to your emotions in a different way by sort of strength. So as you can see, it teaches you a whole new way of processing emotions. That is a fantastic example of functional neuroplasticity. You relearn how to feel, but that's huge. I don't like, I don't know, maybe because I'm a psychologist, I can appreciate the, the, the greatness of that. But to me, that's mind blowing. Right, so it kind of liberates you from, from suffering by, re, by creating a whole new way of, of relating to what, you, to what happens to you. In fact, if I may share like a little snippet perhaps from my own meditation practice, because I've, I have far more than 9,000 hours of meditation behind me. And if anything, I think I feel more, like when I'm happy, I'm, it's, like, it's not, more intensely happy, but it's kind of more profoundly happy. Like stupid things can make me happy. Like today I went, there's a, there's a terrace here. And so I went out this morning and I had coffee, but I was like, I was standing up and there's this pleasant little wind blowing and it for some reason made me very happy. So when you're happy, you're like truly happy. But then I can also say from experience that my negative emotions tend to be perhaps even more intense in some strange way, or at least more clear. Like when I'm sad, that's like a razor sharp sadness. 
But what meditation does, it's kind of helps me live through these emotions in all their fullness, but it doesn't make me want to run away from them. I don't see them as my enemies. I don't see them as something that I won't be able to survive. So I think this is what they're saying here, only with a lot of scientific jargon that doesn't make it as beautiful as it actually is. That would be an example of, a, of functional neuroplasticity. So you don't really need to increase anything. You just need to create new circuitry in the brain and validate it long enough. What's surprising and good is that even after eight weeks, you can see some benefit. Although you have to keep in mind that the MBSR is quite an intense program, which involve, involves at least 20 minutes of meditation per day, plus yoga, plus walking meditation and a lot of other activities, informal mindfulness and so on. So it's by no means five minutes a day. It's an intense program. Um, ah, okay, so yeah, this is this quote I also put out because um, it talks about, re it has to do with the reinforcement of patterns that I was talking about previously. So they say that the fact that the short, so this is one of the findings that the short term MBSR affected the connections between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So long-term meditators didn't have this connection in any specific way, either good or bad, but MBSR after eight weeks would strengthen these connections, right? Whereas with long-term meditators, that was not necessarily uh, the case. So why am I emphasizing this? Because prefrontal cortex has to do with what we do intentionally and what we intellectually decide. And when I talk about sort of being very clear about your intention, that's the part of your brain that you will use. So in the beginning, as you're implementing a new behavioral pattern, your prefrontal cortex is extremely important because of discipline and clarity and technique and execution and analysis and validation and everything that I told you about. So here they show experimentally that that's the case. In the beginning, you really have to be very intentional and focused about that. But then after a long time, it becomes simply the way you exist, simply the way you work. And this goes not just for mindfulness, but for any technique that you introduce, either a competing response or a cognitive diffusion or whatever way, breathing exercise, grounding, anchoring, whatever, uh, whatever you want to try out in the beginning and for, for a specific time here, it's eight weeks, but possibly even longer, the study didn't, didn't really examine that, you will have to be very intentional and conscious about it. So even when you feel disappointment, it's where discipline comes in. You say, okay, now I feel very disappointed, but then I'm just going to do it again. Um, I don't usually like Zen Buddhism because I think it's unnecessarily harsh and not too fond of their theory either, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but they, they they have this proverb that I really like. Uh, that they say, like, if you can't find time to meditate 30 minutes, then you should meditate 60 minutes. And this is basically what it says here. Okay, so the second study that I want to show is an example of structural neuroplasticity. So the title is kind of pompous and I'm having a hard time believing these results, but since they were published in a peer reviewed journal, you know, let's assume that they have some merit to them. Uh, it says brief mindfulness meditation induces gray matter changes in a brain hub. So um, I highlighted this part here and took a screenshot of it. Uh, according to these, these authors, after only 10 hours of meditation, so not sitting for 10 hours, but overall meditating for 10 hours, following the protocol that they assembled, uh, you are able to create visibly visible, visible changes in the thickness of gray matter in specific parts of your brain. To me, this is almost fantastical. But so increases were often uh, detected in areas involving interoceptive awareness, so knowing what's happening inside of you, which is usually what we ba base introspection on, and self-regulation, right? ACC is anterior cingular cortex. That's also part of the limbic system. Insular cortex, which has to do with proprioception. So knowing, again, what's happening inside of your body. Uh, prefrontal cortex and sensory cortices. So basically, you become uh, 
those those parts of uh, those parts that actually fuel how mindfulness work become thicker after such a short period of time. Additionally, also hippocampus, which has to do uh, with memory, and they even notice that amygdala reduces in volume after only ten hours. Like this is to me, when people talk about magic, this is what I what I will would, would think of. So even amygdala becomes smaller. So I'm going to go to the other side and just read parts of the of the conclusion. But this is a hopefully it's clear why this is an example of structural neuroplasticity because you actually create visible changes. Like you take an M, you scan your brain in the beginning, scan your scan your brain after the study. You can physically measure and see that certain areas have now become bigger or smaller. So like that is the level to which we can change our brain. I find that to be just completely fascinating. So what they say, even though this happens after only 10 hours, they say, we do not yet know how long the plasticity will last. This warrants further investigation. And this is what I was telling you about, sort of when you start implementing a skill or a new, new kind of new, new mechanism instead of picking, it's very important not to stop or slow down just because you've achieved the level of success because we still don't know when that becomes irreversible. And again, this does not go only with mindfulness. You will find a lot of numbers online, like 21 days, 100 and I don't know what days. That's all not accurate information. I, I was struggling to find a word that was appropriate to say. So none of that makes any sense. There's no basis in science for that. We really have no idea, which is why when you implement techniques, you should think of them in terms of from now on without saying, okay, I will just stop picking and then I'll stop using my competing responses or I will meditate until I'm no longer stressed and then I'll stop. That's not a very good approach. So that's everything that I had prepared for you today. Um, I'm going to close the poll now and tell you what the topic will be for our webinar in September, and then we'll go to your Q&A. Okay, let's see what one. Um, well, we seem to have a bit of a problem, just one second. Oh, okay, there is no tie. Sorry, I I was um. I thought for a second that there's a tie. So what the the winning uh, the winning topic is working with difficult emotions and thoughts. And then um, and then the runner up is let me see, the runner up topic is self worth, compassion, and picking. Here I will share the results with you in case. Uh, in case you want to check them out and then maybe suggest a topic that you don't see there, but you'd like me to put next month. So we will be talking about working with difficult emotions and thoughts in September. Okay, so um, before, before we start, as always, uh, Skinpick is giving you a discount valid in the next six days, seven days, sorry but it's a $60 discount, hence the number six in my mind. So if you join the next week, you can, you can, use, the, you can use the discount. 